Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss one of the questions that we had from the candidates as a request to discuss spinal shock. Spinal shock one of is one of the topics that had come as a short answer question and apparently was also asked in the viva. So let's discuss about the significance of spinal shock. So a 34 year old male presented to the emergency with neck pain inability to move bilateral upper and lower limbs after a history of road traffic accident. On examination, he was conscious, oriented to time, place and person with blood pressure of around 108 to 68 and pulse of 108 and respiratory rate of 25. So basically, more or less his hemodynamic status is maintained. The pulse is a bit on the higher side, that is he is having some tachycardia. On investigations, as we see over here, the lordosis in the lateral external cervical spine is maintained and so is in the AP. Even the dynamic x-rays are not suggestive of any gross cervical instability or fractures. When we see this MRI, this is the T2 weighted image of the MRI because we can see this hyper intense CSF column over here. So when we see this, we see some amount of cord edema that is present in the cervical spine, which may be secondary to the injury that the patient sustained. Now on examination, as per the Asia scaling, the upper limb score is 0, lower limb motor score is 0, perianal sensation is absent, voluntary anal contraction is absent, deep tendon reflexes are absent and bulbo k reflex is absent. So what is the significance of this? What exactly is the Asia grade or the AIS grade of the patient? Whether he is AIS A, B, C, D or E. What exactly is it? Or whether the patient is in spinal shock. Where and how does this question come in? So this question primarily comes in because if ever we have such a patient after trauma, after a short duration or reporting immediately after trauma and the bulbo k reflex is absent and there are no movements and sensation at all. It may be difficult for us to say what exactly is the AIS grade of the patient because the bulbo k reflex being absent, we think or we can't confirmatorily say whether the patient is out of spinal shock or not. The learning objectives of this session are going to be the history of spinal shock, the definition, the stages of spinal shock followed by the pathophysiology, the duration and examination and how do you manage a patient who is having spinal shock. When we have a patient in the emergency, the one of the major goals is to prevent any further injury to the spine and to maintain the cardiovascular stability. So we have to immobilize the spine of the patient, we have to ensure to maintain the hemodynamic support that is MAP should be 85 to 90 mm of Hg. The blood pressure should be such that the mean arterial pressure should be between 85 to 90 milligrams of mercury. So my friends over here is important that the support is taken from the ER team or the intensivist team so that we ensure that the blood pressure is such that this MEP is maintained. Along with that we have to ensure that respiratory support is present and the patient is not developing any form of respiratory failures or difficulty. Along with this we have to give supportive treatment to prevent any Cushing's or stress related ulcers to prevent bed sore. Bed sore prevention starts immediately from the ER the hemodynamic support and thromboprophylaxis. We are going to discuss this shortly. When we talk about spinal shock in history, for the first time in the year 1750, Witt had first described the phenomenon. Followed by that in the year 1841, Hall introduced the term spinal shock. And in the year 1890, Bastian defined it as complete severance of the spinal cord that results in total loss of motor and sensory function below the level of the lesion as well as permanent extension of tendon reflexes and muscular tone despite the reflex arc remaining intact. So basically what Bastian told was there is a complete severance of the functions below the level of injury be it motor function or the sensory function 
and along with this the reflexes are going to be extinct permanently so is a motor tone even though if the reflex arc remains intact however followed by this sherrington replace the permanent with a temporary extension because what they saw was people get the motor and sensation back so this is not a phase which is permanent but it may be a temporary phase polysynaptic reflexes are depressed for shorter duration than the monosynaptic reflexes hence the polysynaptic reflexes may come faster and earlier as compared to monosynaptic reflexes once the patient starts coming out of spinal shock so spinal shock as per the definition is a condition of transient physiologic rather than autonomic reflex depression of the spinal cord function below the level of injury so again it is a condition which is number one transient it is a physiologic rather than anatomic reflex depression of the spinal cord function below the level of injury so all these five components of the definition are very much important the most important thing is that spinal shock is usually a temporary state and not a permanent state when we talk about spinal shock candidates tend to get confused between what is the difference between the spinal shock and neurogenic shock so when we talk about spinal shock there is an immediate temporary loss of total power sensation and reflexes below the level of injury neurogenic shock is sudden loss of sympathetic nerve nervous system signals now the blood pressure in both the cases hypotensive and the pulse is bradycardia it is lower than normal now the bulbo cavernous reflex in case of a patient in spinal shock is absent however it may be variable in a patient with neurogenic shock in regards to the motor system the patient who presents to you after a spinal shock or in a state of spinal shock would have flaccid paralysis however the picture is variable when we talk about a patient who is in neurogenic shock generally what is the time of the shock so 48 to 72 hours is the timeline of spinal shock after sustaining spinal cord injury so is similarly neurogenic shock which is 48 to 72 hours after the spinal cord injury the mechanism of the two is different in regards to spinal shock the peripheral neurons become temporarily unresponsive to the brain stimuli so temporarily whatever stimulus the brain is giving whatever the command is giving they don't follow it however in a case of neurogenic shock there is a disruption of autonomic pathways loss of sympathetic tone and there is a vasodilatation so the sympathetic tone goes away completely hence there is vasodilation and there is a disruption of autonomic pathways which causes neurogenic shock so the mechanism of both the systems of both these entities is pretty much different with primary differences being in the mechanism the status of the bulbo cavernous reflex and the status of the motor functions